please welcome to the stage Trey Allen. Good morning. Uh, and now, a word from the judicial branch. Uh, my name is Trey Allen, uh, and I am honored to be able to say a few words of introduction uh, for our next speaker. I'm also a little nervous uh, because, number one, he's the highest judicial officer in the state of North Carolina, our Chief Justice. Number two, uh, he's my boss. Um, I serve him, I serve you as the general counsel or the top lawyer for our state's court system, which has some 6,000 elected officials and, and employees. And of course, I'm talking about um, Paul Newby. The schedule says I have five minutes to introduce him, but by order of the court, I have three. Uh, so so I'll, I'll move along at a good clip. Of course, I could, he's got a duly impressive resume after growing up in Jamestown. He went to Duke University. To try to uh, remedy that failing, uh, he attended law school at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, <laughs> went into, uh, he went into private practice. Uh, he served for 19 years as an assistant U.S. attorney before answering God's call and running for the North Carolina Supreme Court and winning in 2004. I work for him now for the second time because in 2005, it was my great privilege to serve as one of his first law clerks when he was the newest member of the North Carolina Supreme Court. He has been a model judge. I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that Paul Newby is the gold standard for conservative judges in the state of North Carolina. And as I go around the state, people all over the state, of course, respect and admire our Chief Justice. But what becomes apparent is it's not just because of the office that he holds. It's because of the person he is. If you spend any time with Paul Newby and his wife Macon, you quickly come to realize that the most important thing, the center of their lives, is not public office, it's not politics, it's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Chief Justice Newby loves Micah 6.8, and I hope he's not mad at me if he plans to quote it himself, but, but I want to quote part of it. O oh man, <clears throat> O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Please join me in welcoming the man who lives these traits, certainly better than any other judge I have known, the Chief Justice of the great state of North Carolina, Paul Newby. Thank you. Thank y'all very much. Thank y'all. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank y'all very much. Thank y'all. Uh, somebody said it, no, you're not going to hear Scooby Dooby vote for Newby. We're done with that. <laughs> Your state constitution begins with these words. We, the people of the state of North Carolina, grateful to Almighty God, the sovereign ruler of nations. The sovereignty of God. Do we truly believe in the sovereignty of God? And what does the sovereignty of God mean? It means God is great and God is good. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. First, let me thank uh, Trey. I got to know him as a, a Marine JAG officer as I interviewed him. Uh, I'm so proud of him. He reminds me an awful lot of me in 2004 uh, when uh, his desire uh, to serve on the North Carolina Supreme Court is 
after a time of prayer with his wife, Taryn, uh, their children, he has this sense of calling. Uh, just like when he signed up for the Marine Corps, uh, illustrating more than self his country loved. Uh, and, uh, you know, I certainly would be proud uh, to serve with Trey. Uh, so it was November 3rd of 2020, election night. Uh, I was not doing too well. Uh, I, I knew enough North Carolina history to appreciate that we would be in for the battle of our lives, even though supposedly everybody who was going to vote had voted, oh, but wait, not quite, because uh, they had extended voting till November the 9th. Uh, and uh, my wife, Macon, Macon's in the back, y'all can see her, my much, much better half, Macon. Uh, we had no idea what that journey would be like, but we knew we were on a journey. Uh, for 40 days and 40 nights, seriously, from election night until my opponent surprised me with that phone call on a Saturday morning when she conceded, 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, we very much understood uh, that we were in a battle. Uh, we were gonna be okay. I mean, my goodness, I had no idea I'd ever have the privilege of being a justice and I uh, never thought about being Chief Justice till things just opened up. And uh, we knew that the direction of our judicial branch uh, was hanging in the balance uh, and how that would impact our state of North Carolina. Uh, a couple of verses came to mind, uh, although <laughs> uh, we spent much time in prayer and reading scripture. Uh, but one was in Exodus 14, 14. Moses had led the children of Israel out after all these miraculous signs, and they thought they were on easy street, and they weren't. You had the Red, uh, the, uh, Red Sea on one side, you had Pharaoh's army on the other side. And Moses was like, Lord, if you, if you don't deliver us, we're stuck. Uh, we're annihilated unless you do it. Uh, certainly there was nothing Macon and I could do. Many of you worked so hard in being sure that there was integrity in the process, and I thank you for that. Uh, all of you, or so many of y'all, prayed for Macon and me during that time, and we're grateful for that. Uh, but you know, one of the lessons I learned is uh, it's in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Uh, and after enduring that, uh, the cross for us, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And folks, one day soon, God the Father will say, son, the time is now. Go get your children. So what do we do as we're, as we're waiting uh, for uh, that time? Uh, by God's grace, uh, he said, Paul, I want you to be Chief Justice, and God put me in that position. But God didn't do that to our, our brother Dan Forrest. Why, God? Uh, why do you raise some and not others? God is great. That means he's all-powerful. God is good. That means he filters everything through his love. Uh, and when we as humans can't see that things are going the way that we think that they should, when you can't trust his hand, always trust his heart. So uh, I, I, I become the Chief Justice and I'm immediately in 1 Kings 3, uh, where it says that Solomon cried out to God, I'm just a child, I can't do this. Uh, Lord, unless you equip me, I can't serve as king. I'm, Lord, unless you equip me, I can't serve as the Chief Justice. Please pray for me. Pray that God gives me wisdom and discernment and favor uh, as I seek to do biblical justice, equal justice for all in our court system. Uh, but I did tell Macon, you know, Macon, 
I'm a little concerned because folks call me chief all the time. And scripture's clear, God resists the proud. Uh, I, I'm a little worried about, on the one hand, I can't do it, on the other hand, chief this, chief that, you know, am, am I get a, get a little proudful? And as only wife's kind, can, she kind of winked at me, said, don't worry, I got this. <laughs> she has written for me a verse that I have in my office, very prominently displayed, uh, 1 Timothy 1.15. It says, Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. Uh, as I struggle in the trenches every day, uh, as I wrestle with what's going on in our state, our nation, our culture, our society, the world, as all of us have family struggles, all of us have professional struggles, God, are you sovereign? Are you hearing us? I know you're great. I know you're good. But God, I'm wrestling. This is my message for you. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. Psalm 139 says, before he knits you together in your mother's womb, the days ordained for you were written in his book. Regardless of the circumstances, we all have the platform that he has given us for what purpose? Well, first off, be sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that you have put your faith in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Uh, and then it says, we are therefore his ambassadors, as though Christ is making his appeal through us. Be reconciled to God. God made Jesus who knew no sin become sin for us, that we could become his righteousness. Folks, we live in a lost and dying world where there is epidemic of, you thought I was going to say COVID, there's an epidemic of hopelessness. And we, through God's grace, have the answer that people are craving. I don't care what your personal life circumstances are right now. I do know this. God has called you to that position. And he will empower you to do what he has called you to do, which is to be his ambassador. Uh, many of us may feel like that we're kind of uh, struggling and yet not seeing the outcome of our struggle in a positive way. Um, there was a pastor, a preacher, just finished seminary, and uh, no church asked him to come preach. Finally, this uh, wealthy older lady said, uh, uh, Son, uh, if you're willing to speak to some of the folks on the bayous, this was in New Orleans, uh, I'll buy a boat for you, and you can take the message of hope to all the people out on the bayou. Uh, the preacher said, well, I've got nothing else to do. All right. Uh, so he got in the boat and uh, went along uh, some of the villages close to New Orleans, but finally he figured he needed to head out uh, further into the bayou. Uh, so he dressed casually one day because he knew he was going to be in an all-day boat ride and got in his boat and started going in and out of the uh, different turns and twists of the bayou. He got to one real steep, real sharp bend in the bayou, and wouldn't you know it, his boat broke down. <laughs> he had just enough momentum to uh, uh, glide it into the bank. He got up in the middle of nowhere, and he kind of had a conversation with God like we've all had. Lord, what are you doing? I mean, you, you didn't give me a church. I'm having to preach out of a boat, and now the boat won't work. God, what are you doing? Well, 
uh, he walked up and there was a clearing and there was a big gangling teenager who came up to him. Teenager said, I'm Danny. I'm the biggest, baddest boy in the bayou. I've whooped about everybody around here that's my size and most of them that are bigger than I am. And I can whoop you. <laughs> the man says, uh, uh, Danny, I'm, I'm not a threat to you. I'm a preacher. He said, you don't look like no preacher I ever saw. He, he, he said, I, I, I'm a preacher. He said, well, go up there and talk to my mama on the porch and we'll see what she says. So he goes up on the porch and he said, ma'am, uh, I'm a preacher. I've got a boat down here. The boat broke down at the bend in the bayou. Um, I just need to figure out how to, how to get things fixed and I'll I, I get, get away from y'all. She said, young man, uh, I don't know that I've ever heard a preacher before. You say you're a preacher, can you preach? He said, well, ma'am, I'm, I'm glad to. He said, well, do it right now. So <laughs> he pulled out his Bible, started reading John 3. You know that story about that church guy, Nicodemus, who thought he was kind of working his way to God. And Jesus said, well, <laughs> you know, hold on, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. What do you mean to be born again? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. But anyway, he got to John 3, 16 and 17, and y'all know it. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God uh, didn't send Jesus into the world to con condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. When he got to that point, he started hearing some sniffling. He looked up and that lady had tears running down her face. She said, young man, I, I had no idea God loved me that much. Um, I, I, the God who made all this loves me. That's news to me. And he heard some more sniffling. He looked over at Danny, the biggest, baddest uh, boy in the bayou. He was crying too. And both of them said, I want to know God through Jesus. So they prayed right there. That shack in the bayous became a delivery room. Two people delivered into the kingdom of God. And you know, they said... They, they, they said, um, uh, we want our friends and neighbors to hear this message. They uh, had meetings out there on that clearing for the next 10 nights, and then they had a big baptism right there in the bend in the bayou where the boat broke down. Uh, you may feel like your boat's broken down, and you may feel like you're lost in the bend in the bayou. Persevere. Persevere. Be assured that God is at work. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in Him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and be God's ambassadors to the world. God bless you.